Hey guys, uh, this video is going to be about deck building in Hearthstone. Introduction to duck deck building 101, basically. This part is basically one of, if not my favorite part of Hearthstone, and with the launch of League of Explorers, I thought that this was something that might be interesting to a lot of other players. I feel like we've all thought of a lot of cool decks every expansion, and you know some work out better than others. You know, you know what? what makes the deck viable, you know, why does that happen? Um, so I feel like power and consistency are the main factors on what makes a deck strong. So power is very general, basically means, you know, what, what your deck does, you know, what are you doing? Uh, this is kind of like automatically factored into the metagame, depending on what your deck is doing. It could be strong in some metagames, but maybe weaker in others. So, you know, as far as say building a deck for the metagame, that is part of you know what the part of the power of the deck. Uh, consistency isn't really as general as power, but I feel like it has kind of like a very precise definition. Uh, what it means is how consistent your deck does what it wants to do. And also, this is actually pretty important. It's not just how consistent your deck does what it wants to do, but what happens when you don't get to do what you want? You know, because what you're doing every game is, you know, you're not always gonna get Zombie Chow into Muster into Mini Bot. So, all right. So I guess that's the definition of what power consistency are, and those are the main factors on what makes a deck good. Synergy is increases your power but generally decreases consistency so synergy is kind of a way to boost the power of your deck it's kind of like a little a smaller concept a good example of synergy is is quartermaster quartermaster makes your deck much more powerful and does something that other decks are scared of you know that's why so many people play around quartermaster you, you kind of have to a lot of times because so it's like it's definitely increasing the power of your deck a lot you know if if your opponents are even so scared of it that they're willing to do a lot of suboptimal things but quartermaster decreases your consistency so what happens when your deck doesn't do what you want it to do you don't curve out perfectly you know so that's why i think mid-range paladin can, can handle quartermaster much better than secret paladin because it's a more reactive deck based on more of kind of like the ebb and flow, the feel of the game. You fight hard for the board as mid-range paladin, and then you kind of decide how much you need to commit to the board in order to keep board control without losing too much to AoE maybe. So you know, you're know you using your hero power a lot late game. It makes Quartermaster much more viable because uh, you do need the power of Quartermaster in, in this deck more and you can afford to lose some consistency on your early game. You're not just looking to drop the most powerful man on every turn necessarily, and when the game gets longer and you're using your hero power more, then Quartermaster becomes more playable. Uh, Secret Paladin, on the other hand, is much more one-dimensional, and also you have other power cards, like playing Mr. Challenger by itself, or playing Secret Keeper and Five Secrets. What it's doing is already really strong, and you almost never want to get to late game. You don't even want to use your hero power a lot in this deck. Uh, by the time that you're using your hero power, Secret Paladin, you're likely getting to the point where the game is going to be decided based on your existing board. You know, you might be filling in from your hero power some turns, but that's not. Those dudes probably aren't going to win you the game. It's what happened beforehand and how strong your board is before it finally dies. Uh, so, the core master for this, you can't afford to lose consistency. For that kind of deck and you're doing other powerful things you don't re really necessarily need to have the quartermaster um you know so when are you giving up too much consistency for power uh one example i'm gonna give is power overwhelming and handlock uh, what does power roaming do in handlock it basically synergizes with shadow flame and offers say some burst of damage at the end of the game to finish off your opponent. Uh, it doesn't help with creature trading that much because Handlock already has very big minions that are unlikely to need power roaming to trade. Uh, you know, power roaming on a sludge belcher to trade into Dr. Boom, it's not going to happen very much. Uh, it's, it's not really relevant. I mean, maybe sometimes, but for the most part, you have Big Game Hunter 
or something like that. You know, or you just trade a giant in or something. You, uh, you don't. And also, we don't need the burst of damage at the end of the game to win. Uh, you know, what we need is health gain, taunts, um, you know, removal, big minions, things like that. So at this point, we're basically talking about a small gain of burst damage at the end, and then the more important synergy with Shadow Flame. When I'm talking about power arming and handlock. And since since what really what's relevant is the Shadow Flame synergy, it's it's at that point it's kinda of like a one card combo very inconsistent for an effect that isn't potentially necessary because you can shadow flame very big already up to eight as handlock and it's not something that really wins you the game you know something like savage or enforced nature you almost never use one without the other as druid kind of and but that one is so much stronger because it kind of outright wins you the game so i feel like it's unnecessary to use power overwhelming and handlock because you don't need it uh, so on the other hand, you know, Reno is a lot of power, it gains something maybe like 30 points of power for 6 mana, kind of comparable to a 15-15 minion, which is 30 power, uh, maybe. Reno might be worth giving up some consistency for, it's because it makes your deck do something very powerful. It's probably the strongest minion in the game if you count the battle cry compared to like anything like a, even like a Sarah or Deathwing. Uh, I feel like it works better in decks that run a lot of situational removal and plays from behind compared to a zoo or paladin type deck where you're trying to play the strongest thing every turn and aim to kill your opponent before they have enough time to react kind of or to, to do what they want more 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 than more than enough time to react I guess. The Canlock can run something like a mind control tech or a demon wrath instead of second hellfire, maybe a refreshment vendor for one of your four drops, and you know maybe like a heal bot sludge belcher lotheb, you know one of each. It doesn't. It's not necessarily that much worse than running, you know, two sludge belchers and one lotheb or, or something. Uh, you 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 don't want to run one muster for battle and one spider tank, or like a shredder and a yeti for your four drop. In a tempo deck, yeah, you, know, you, you do you do want to play the strongest thing, so yeah, you know, that's why Reno is much more playable in, in these slow decks because you you want the effect. It's something very powerful that you're willing to build your deck around, and you're you're not giving up as much consistency for that power. So I get I guess a good rule is play some games if you never get the combo off, or maybe even use the card very good. Like the card doesn't have good results, it's after a couple hours of playing, it's likely too, too inconsistent. It's almost never likely that it's not powerful enough. No one ever tries to make a really consistent low power deck. It's Everyone always tries to go for like the brand plus heal bot Twilight Drake thing instead of like, it's, it's not exciting to do something like, oh yeah, I'm gonna play zombie chow muster for battle and stuff. You know, it's if you're making a deck like that, then good, good for you. But that's generally it's the other way around. So I guess like I I want to take a look at basically some powerful decks and what they're what they do. This kind of gives an idea of how powerful your deck has to be to keep up with these. So Secret Paladin. We all know how strong that burst is on turn six when you get Mysterious Challenger off. It's and since at that point they're willing to run all these one drop secrets they actually curve out very strongly before turn six because they use almost the same cards as mid-range paladin but now they have extra filler one drops too like instead of you know whenever mid-range paladin misses a drop or misses a curve a little bit wasting a couple of mana a secret paladin can potentially do the same thing and fill up with some secret as well they're all pretty annoying and strong so it's it's just you know this is really powerful tempo mage with flame maker just potentially blowing out the game same thing with mana worm and even mad scientist it's like a lot of a lot of synergy a lot of power and then it finishes off with a lot of burn something like druid handlocker controller i guess i'm not gonna like go over every single deck that'd take too long but it's just these are like a general rule of you know what th what these decks are doing so, and what you what you need to even compete with them. Uh, so I guess the next point I want to make, probably my last point, is how much power do you need? You know, this leads into the 
question of what is Winmore. I see this term being used a lot. Uh, it's usually used in a very bad connotation, kind of like you know, Winmore. You don't want this effect. Uh, so yeah, I guess like gonna clarify a bit on how much power you need in a deck. Uh, minions get value every turn they're alive. I guess I've said this a lot on my stream before, but like every minion's effect on the board or on the game is X damage every turn based on whatever attack it has. Uh, that's the effect on the game that the minion has generally. Um, and because of this, minions don't survive a long time. Uh, the average time a minion survives on the board is pretty, like very low I think. Uh, might be, just be one turn where most minions die after on your opponent's turn the turn you play them or maybe on your turn like maybe you get one attack on them uh because they simply can't be on the battlefield that long if a minion was on the battlefield that long it would almost single-handedly end the, end the game by itself you know even like a three two in turn one that's left up for five turns almost ends the game on on his own uh so i would say don't count on minions surviving unless they're like low threat Sticky minions like Nerubian Egg, Honey Creeper, or Shielded Mini Bot, or something. Uh, for the most part, minions are gonna just die, and they trade for your opponent's removal spells or their minions. Uh, so you know, only put in as much power as you as you need. Some things happen when they're probably already dead. Kelthazad and Midrange Hunter is probably one of those effects where. Yeah, like high main is sticky and Dr. Boom, you know, high main boom into KT, but it isn't necessary. If you're hitting them in the face with the high main or boom, you probably don't need KT at that point to trade in and get get the values or tempo, you know. At, at, at that point, it would cost you too much consistency to run Kel'Thuzad compared to having a better mid game or early game or more removal. Kind of the same thing, Kel'Thuzad and Control Warrior. If Control Warrior, you know, if you ever actually gain initiative, with the against the faster deck it's very unlikely you'll run out of threats to begin with you can just drop minion after minion so you don't really need the additional power of Kel'Thuzad uh, and also since your goal is like mostly to just have one minion on the battlefield as control warrior because you have so many removals and armor gain to like kind of support that minion you know what I mean like you don't, you could you could play control warrior and ha make the rule like a self rule of never have more than one minion on board unless it's something like Dr. Boom and you could probably do fine you know if you ever have more like a minion you can just at that point keep hitting the, their face with that minion and use your weapons and shield slams and executes to kill any other minion they play and if they ever kill your minion I guess then you drop another one but you know you don't you don't need the KT in control where uh, on the other hand you know some combos are very powerful but the decks need it uh, something like Echo Giants. Echo Giants like needs all that power of Echo Giants because it's very likely they're losing the game before. The situation before your combo is probably your opponent having a decent board and you having no board, no life, and just the combo. So you have a lot of you have a lot of work to do to make a comeback in this matchup. That's why you know Echo Giants isn't really win more. You you need the Echo Giant combo for that deck because that's really the only thing you're doing in that deck is trying to pull off the echo giant combo and maybe if they don't kill you fast enough duplicating sludge belchers and stuff like that you know a another example is kelthazad with some taunters and ramp druid it's pretty good you know what's the situation before playing kt it's probably you're barely surviving against an aggro deck and trying to just drop enough big taunters slash removal to stabilize and getting that KT down in this situation you know, is something you need. You know, when an aggro deck, you know, maybe they leave up a Belcher and then you drop KT. At that point, they have to kill the Belcher. They either kill you that turn, unless they have burn, or they kill you that turn and they have to kill their Belcher and then kill the Zod because then the Belcher comes back. So it's like, it's actually not win more. It's necessary somewhat in these decks because you can't just maybe like you might see games where you actually need this effect a lot of games where you need this effect so kt gives you like the lockout and tempo versus aggro decks and maybe gives you like the potential value of gain slash tempo uh, against other control decks uh so basically that answers the question like what is one more you know what 
I guess hopefully it clarifies what you need, like how much power do you need in your deck. And don't put something in your deck that's like completely unnecessary just to blow up the potential power of your deck when the game is probably already over by then. Like, you know, you don't need any more after that. So I guess that's basically the end of my deck building video. I uh, hope you guys enjoyed it and hope that it puts some new perspective on deck building.